Okay, uh, we are recording. Uh, let me introduce to you guys uh, John Havman, and uh, he will go ahead and tell us a little bit about himself, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you very much. Welcome, okay. John. Uh, thank you, and thanks for inviting me to join you tonight. Um, my name is John Haveman, and I'm a, I'm a Bay Area economist. Uh, I live in San Rafael. I've been here since about, I guess, 2001, at the end of 2001. Uh, I worked for the Public Policy Institute of California for a while as a chief economist at the Bay Area Council. Uh, I started a forecasting firm called Beacon Economics, uh, and I've been largely an independent consultant for the last uh, eight or nine years. Um, Prior to that, I, I've, I've actually worked most of the jobs that, uh, that economists can work. I, I spent seven years teaching at Purdue University. Uh, I was a senior economist at President Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors. I uh, worked for the Federal Trade Commission. Um, I bounced around a little bit. Um, I, I you know, tell people after they've read my entire bio to introduce me that I should give them the shorter one because it either sounds like I can't hold a job or I'm old, maybe both of which are true. Um, at any rate, uh, about two and a half years ago, um, I, I took a little bit of a flyer and I started a thing called NEED, um, the National Economic Education Delegation. Let me share my slide and bring it up here. Um, NEED is a nonprofit uh, designed to uh, help educate the electorate uh, about economic policy issues. Um, actually, before I get into that, um, I, I have a couple of tips that I like to share. Um, I don't know how expert and experienced you, you folks are with Zoom, probably pretty experienced at this point. Um, but up at the top of your screens, there should be a view options button. And I like to suggest that you click, click on that and then a menu comes up and you can click on fit to window at the top and, and side by side down at the bottom. Um, and then I suggest you go to the upper right hand corner of your screen and click on speaker view. Then you should see my slides on the left and me on the right. And there's a slider bar between the two and you can move that wherever you like to, to make the ratio of, of my face to my slides uh, what, what you think is appropriate. Um, at any rate, I started NEED um, about two and a half years ago to try and uh, get the economics profession to get out uh, and tell everybody else what we know about economic policy issues. Um, more or less tired of watching politicians use economics as a, a weapon um, for their own personal agenda rather than as a tool for social good. Um, I figure they get away with that because the electorate doesn't know very much about economic policy and the electorate doesn't know very much about economic policy because we, the economics profession, don't tell them. Uh, very much about uh, economic policy. So this is an effort uh, in a very nonpartisan way um, to get economists out into the wild, uh, talking to folks such as yourselves um, about what we know about economic policy issues and coronavirus economics is one. And the next slide will have a bunch of different topics that we give talks on. Um, but uh, I, I, again, I started about two and a half years ago, um, had a fair amount of success, uh, kind of a nice honorary board with 48 members. Uh, Janet Yellen, Ben Bernanke, the two previous chairs of the Federal Reserve, six former chairs of the Council of Economic Advisors under Republican and Democratic presidents alike. And that's really important to me. It's really important that need be nonpartisan. Um, as, as such, in talking about policy issues like climate change, income inequality, um, and a wide variety of other topics, we don't ever advocate for a particular policy response. You know, we'll highlight the data. Uh, on, a pol on, a, on an issue, we'll highlight how economists think about it, and we'll talk about different policy responses, because um, the, the particular, the, the preferred policy response is going to be in the eye of the, the beholder. So we, we talk about the trade-offs between policy responses and don't advocate for anything in particular. Um, we have 500 members of the delegation. Those are folks like me who are willing to go out and give talks. Um, all have a PhD, most are academic economists. And then we've got some global partners. Um, these are folks all over the world, uh, a couple in England and a couple in Italy, both of, both of which have, have told me once I fix things in the United States, I should come and help fix things there. Uh, I think that's probably a long play. Uh, at any rate, those, that's, that's sort of what need is. We crowdsource all of our slide decks and we have slide decks on, uh, the, on, whoops, on the following set uh, of topics. 
Um, our, our topic list grows pretty steadily, um, but this is what we have sort of in the can right now. And I want to put out an invitation to everybody. Um, I know I'm here because I spoke to a group uh, that, uh, that one of you is also a member of. And if anybody else is a member of a group that brings in speakers, SIRS, Kiwani, Rotary, Lions Club, retirement community, or, or any other environment where folks get together and bring in speakers, be more than happy to come in and talk or to, to line up one of my other delegates to come in and talk. You know, about any one of these policy issues. My slides will be available on my website, so this, this, uh, this uh, slide will as well if, if, uh, if you have an interest. I've also been doing cocktail parties um, where folks will get you know, 10 of their friends together and invite me on to come and be the, be the know-it-all in the room. Um, those, are, those are pretty fun, so if, if you think you might like to do that, be more than happy to. Okay, um, so that's enough about need uh, and enough about me. Um, so this slide deck, as I mentioned, all of our slide decks are crowdsourced by the delegate by the delegation. Um, this one was written by me, uh, Scott Bayer, the chair of the economics department at Clemson University and Jeffrey Wogblum at Emer Emeritus. He's retired from Amherst College. Um, and uh, so what am I gonna talk about? Well, I'm gonna talk about a bunch of things. Well, first I'm gonna address the question of what is this? Right, it's a question to which the answer seems reasonably self-evident, um, but I'm gonna frame it a little bit differently sort of in the context of this talk. I'm uh, going to talk about economic evidence of impact, uh, some economic indicators and the data that, that tell us how we're doing. I'm uh, going to talk about government policy uh, from Congress, from the Federal Reserve, and from states, the social policies. And then we're going to take a look and talk a little bit about the path going forward. What are some forecasts um, and, and how do I think uh, we're doing in dealing with this? Okay, so let's turn to the question of what is this, right? Um, I like to think of this as, a, as generally as a natural disaster. Um, think flood, think earthquake, uh, think hurricane. Um, it's, it's sort of similar along those lines, but it's got important twists. Um, the number one, the first one is that it's global. Uh, it's affecting all of us. The second um, is that its duration is unpredictable. Uh, it's unpredictable and unlike a hurricane, flood or earthquake, uh, its duration is kind of dependent on our actions uh, as I'll make clear as we go through the presentation. Um, finally, it's got a, a, an enormous economic toll, and it's got an economic toll that's potentially durable, right? It's potentially durable because the psychology of this is different from a hurricane, flood, or earthquake, right? Once those things are over, nobody's afraid to go out of their house. Um, but politicians can declare this thing over all they like, but that doesn't mean that people are uh, not going to be afraid to go out of their house. Um, even my co-author, Scott Bayer at Clemson University, uh, he went to the national football championship. He loves football. Um, and he, even he professes that come September, he's not sure he wants to spend Saturday afternoon with 80,000 of his closest friends. Um, so, you know, that kind of psychological uh, impact is going to be potentially durable and, and cause the economic toll to go on. So basically, it's a health crisis um, that's spilled over onto the economy, sort of the perfect storm uh, of economic difficulty. Uh, we, we economists think of recessions as generally coming from three different sources. There's supply side, demand side, and financial sector recessions. In terms of supply side, I, I think probably all of us are old enough to remember the, the oil shocks uh, of the 1970s and 80s. You know, that was when the oil supply was restricted and that uh, led to prices of oil going up and led to recessions. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, we had the global financial crisis which started out as a demand side problem because everybody was using their, their home as an ATM on an automatic teller machine and pulling money out and buying a second, third BMW. Um, and then in 2005 and six, that abruptly came to a halt. Uh, so demand uh, came to a screeching halt, uh, which then turned into a financial sector issue. All right, one thing, uh, one aspect of this recession that is different from other recessions um, is that it really doesn't have a culprit. Um, you could say that the government, the federal and state and local governments are the culprits because they told us to shelter in place, but it doesn't have a culprit that's sort of politically difficult. Um, and by that, I mean, if you think back to the global financial crisis, there was one side of the aisle saying, oh, you folks on, on Wall Street, you know, you got all these new financial instruments, um, this is what led to the crisis. And then the other side of the aisle say, well, you homeowners, you should have known better than to take out the loans that everybody was offering you. This one, there's no culprit. Um, so there's really no political quib um, about whether or not we should act. And as I'll mention later, we, we got action from the government pretty quickly um, and pretty big uh, in a big way. So, so that was really, really helpful. Okay, so that's the what is this. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some economic data. 
Um, so this is gross domestic product. Every quarter, uh, we measure how fast the economy has been growing um, as a percentage points of GDP growth. The blue bars going up indicate growth. The red bars going down indicate declines. Um, this has been the recovery. Here's the global financial crisis, but the recovery. And here uh, is what so, so far we think is GDP declined for the first quarter of this year. First quarter was January, February, March. And really, um, the, the, the COVID really only inf in, uh, impacted the last three weeks of March. Um, so that was three weeks out of three months and it caused GDP to decline by 5%. Um, some folks are estimating that the second quarter of this year will come in at about a ne about negative 40, 40%. Um, so that's, that's uh, April, May, June. Um, so we've got that release to look forward to. Um, this 5% decline and the other declines that I mentioned are largely because of a reduction in consumer spending, right? So this graph here is, is zero, and this is January 20, right? So it's going through January, February, and into March. Consumer spending was, you know, relatively constant. Uh, and then we, this is, this actually started before we went into shelter in place. People stopped spending money, stopped going out, and we had shelter in place orders, and consumer spending went down uh, by more than 30%, by about a third. Um, and this really shocked me when I first saw it because, you know, it looks like we were only sort of as a nation kind of sheltered in place for about three weeks. And um, then we started coming out and now we're just down 11% on June 10. And, uh, you know, we've probably crept up a little bit since June 10, but this is the latest data available. But we have come back very significantly. Um, and that's not because shelter in place has been lifted everywhere. Um, started much earlier than that. So spending's on the rise. Um, this is sort of the first set of data that started coming out. These are new weekly unemployment claims. Um, and you know, we were humming along with, you know, sort of every week, 200,000, 250,000 people would apply for unemployment insurance because they lost their job. Um, and then boom, we ran into uh, the COVID induced recession. And those numbers jumped up to about 6.6 .6 million. Right. Uh, this is going back to the global financial crisis. So at the peak of the global financial crisis, uh, on a weekly basis, we had 665,000 people applying for unemployment insurance. So this is just to, to illustrate how quickly and hard this really hit. Right. We had more than 10 times the number of people at the peak of the global financial crisis in two consecutive weeks. Right. And it started coming down. Right here we've got the detail, right? Jumped up to 6.9 million, 6.6, uh, .6, and then fell uh, down to where last week it was announced 1.5 million people applied for unemployment insurance for the first time. Um, I see a lot of newspaper reports that say, oh, this number is coming down, so things are getting better. Um, that's not really true, because this is more people who have lost their jobs. Uh, things are getting worse at a slower rate rather than getting better. All right, and since uh, late March, 42 plus million people have applied for unemployment insurance, which should drive the unemployment rate up to about 20 to 22 percent. Um, you know, this data was really helpful early on, um, but I don't think it's helpful for gauging what kind of progress we're making in terms of coming back. Um, instead, I like to look at continuing unemployment claims. Um, here we've got, so not people who are applying for the first time, but the number of people who are who received unemployment insurance every week, who are continuing to receive unemployment. And you can see, you know, it ramped up pretty quickly to a peak in early May of about 25 million people receiving unemployment. That fell down to where it's sort of lingered for the last four weeks, well, up through June 6, um, at about 20 million, right? So we need to see this number came down, but it's been pretty steady. It's not coming down very much uh, in the latter part of the data. Uh, so I'm not convinced that uh, ultimately the economic pain amongst those who have lost their jobs is, is uh, retreating at all. Um, so here we've got uh, non-farm payrolls. Um, this graph was a, a fairly pretty graph before uh, we had the numbers in April. Um, you could see changes and this looked like a really, really bad period in our economic history. Right. This is a global financial crisis again. And at its peak, we were losing about 750,000 jobs a month. And we didn't just boom, jump right into 750,000. We kind of ramped up to it. All right. Well, this is the recovery. A lot of blue bars going up, job creation. Um, and then suddenly in, uh, in March, we lost 700,000 jo 700, jobs. In April, we lost 20.5 million jobs. 
Now in May, we did bounce back with a, an increase of 2.5 million jobs, but we're still down by about 19 million jobs. Right? Uh, that's an awful lot. Uh, and that will produce unemployment estimates that are upwards of 20%. Unfortunately, the unemployment estimates that we've gotten, right, and this is the unemployment rate going back to World War II, Right, you can see in recessions, these gray bars indicate recessions, wow. unemployment rate goes up and then comes down, up, down, up, down, right? Well, uh, in, uh, in March, I'm sorry, in May, uh, we got an unemployment announcement of 14.7%. And then in, in June, I'm sorry, in April is 14.7%, in May, 13.3%. Um, these numbers are less than the 20% numbers that I mentioned. However, the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, uh, confessed to make an error, making an error. Um, they declared a lot of people as being voluntarily out of work, uh, essentially categorized as on vacation rather than being furloughed. So the appropriate unemployment number for April was closer to 20% and for May was closer to about 16%. Um, next week, Thursday, we'll get a sense for what the unemployment rate was in June. And I expect it to have come down a little bit, but probably not very much. Um, I don't like this measure of, the, of unemployment, uh, given what we're, we're going through. There are other me measures. There's another one called the U6 unemployment rate, and that includes people who are working part-time that, that were not before this started and don't want to be. They want to be working full-time. It also includes people who are unemployed and not looking for a job. Usually, in order to be categorized as unemployed, you have to be looking for a job. Otherwise, you're out of the labor force. Well, this time a lot of people are unemployed, but they're not looking for a job because they're anticipating being called back to the job that they were let go from. And if we include those folks, those folks marginally uh, affiliated with the labor force, then we have unemployment rates that are up in the 20s, right? And this is getting closer towards sort of Great Depression numbers of 25%. Um, so we're kind of in Great Depression territory. That's not to say that we're gonna be in this for 12 years, we're not. And we're only going to sort of feel like we're in this for maybe three years. And um, that seems like a long time, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's probably the case. And the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, has estimated that we won't actually get back to where we would have been without this until 2029. Right? So that's about another nine years from now. So it's going to take us a long time to fully recover from this. Um, but we'll feel like we've recovered it in, two, in two or three years. Okay, so that's the unemployment rate. We can look at what's going on in California, right? Employment growth, employment in California, the, the red lines, the United States, blue lines, California, you know, pretty comparable California with what's going on in the United States in terms of unemployment rate and in terms of employment declines. All right, what about the stock market? Everybody wants to see what the stock market was doing. Well, um, stock market, I've normalized these to 100 in early January. So we got a little bit of growth. Um, and then we started, this is when we started hearing about uh, what's going on in China. We thought, oh, you know, that'll hurt us a little bit. So the stock market's <clears> down <throat> a little bit. Then the stock market does what it always does. It says, oh, never mind, <clears throat> bad news. Um, and it kept going up until the bad news got really bad. We started hearing about Iran and Italy and that went down. And then the Federal Reserve jumped in um, with some stimulus. Uh, and then, I'm sorry, this bar is in the wrong place. It should be back over here. This is, this is right about uh, March 3 when the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates and the markets jumped up. But then we got the cancellation of March Madness, the cancellation of the rest of the, of the NBA season, the cancellation of Coachella, uh, cancellation of Major League Baseball, and we bottomed out here. Huh, I'm not sure exactly what happened. Um, this, this arrow is supposed to be moved back, I apologize. Um, but at any rate, the stock markets, this is when the $2.2 .2 trillion spending package was passed by Congress. And the markets largely thought, hmm, okay, federal government, they've got our back. So, you know, everything's okay. Let's bounce right back. Um, and you can see that the S&P has gotten, at one point, it got close to where it was in early January. You know, probably without this, we'd be up here somewhere. So it hasn't fully recovered. Um, but I think it's going to go in fits and starts between you know, zero and 15% declines between now and when, probably when we have a, a vaccine um, or we get really comfortable and, and with, that we understand how to deal with this and cases decline fairly significantly. Um, okay, so that's the stock market. Um, so I want to go back to this notion that we're kind of dealing with a natural disaster. If we think about a natural disaster, a sort of a natural progression of how we deal with it, right? The first is 
<clears throat> we try to mitigate the effects, right? And this is sort of what I mean here, and I'm sure all of us have images in our head um, of people being airlifted off of their roofs uh, from Hurricane Katrina, um, from the Houston uh, uh, hurricane, right? And that's sort of what I'm thinking about there. Um, and then we tend to the vulnerable, and here I go to the hundreds of people that were sleeping in the Superdome uh, in New Orleans. Uh, and then we go in, when the water has receded, we go in and we shore up structures, all right? What structures can we shore up? What needs to be torn down? And then ultimately we rebuild the things that were torn down. There's sort of direct corollaries in all of this in the current crisis, right? So the mitigation of effects, that's probably the social policy that we're talking about, this shelter in place and social distancing, trying to reduce the spread uh, of, the, of the disease. Tending to the vulnerable, that's a lot of fiscal policy. Um, that's getting people uh, paid sick leave. That's getting people extended unemployment insurance. Um, the $1,200 checks that went out. The shoring up of structures is really kind of trying to maintain the link between employees and employers. So when it does come time to open back up, the process is relatively easy. And I'll talk about how I don't think we've done a really good job with that. Then ultimately, there's the rebuilding, um, and that's the stimulus. Right, when we find that maybe the economy isn't coming back as quickly as we'd like it to, we get some stimulus. All right, first I want to talk a little about, bit about the, the social policy. Um, when I talk to a lot of people, there's, there's a sort of misperception about why we're sheltering in place, why we're social distancing. Um, folks think that that's going to get us through this more quickly, um, when in fact the, the opposite is true. All right, if we don't do anything, if we didn't have any protective measures, this red bar is probably what we would experience. Right, we were experiencing a situation where the number of cases ramps up really quickly, peaks at a pretty high level, and then because we've all had it or we've got herd immunity, it comes down pretty rapidly and it's over. Right? The problem with letting that happen is that we've got a healthcare capacity. Right? We've got healthcare capacity that is somewhere there. Um, and this peak up here is well above that, which that means that a lot of people aren't gonna get a healthcare and a lot, of, a lot more folks will die than need to. So we wanna flatten the curve, push down on the top of that, that pushes things out in time and, and we get a peak that's somewhere here. And I've drawn this as being above the dotted line there, our pre-COVID healthcare capacity, because what we're also doing is we're buying time. We're buying time during which we should be able to increase our healthcare capacity. Right, so we don't have to push it down as, as hard as we might. Right? So the, the consequence of pushing it down is that when cases come on more slowly, they peak at a lower level, but they continue for a much longer period of time. And that has economic implications. Right? So here, the going down, the, the pink shaded area there, that's, that might be the economic implications of just letting her rip and not trying to shelter in place or social distance. Whereas if we do have protective measures, we're gonna get economic com consequences that are more like the, the, the blue line, the blue area there, right? So the economic impact is, is significant right away, right? As people just stop, uh, it uh, troughs at a relatively low level and then goes on for longer. Goes on for longer because we have cases for a longer period of time. And then there's that whole psychological element that I talked about earlier, Right, and this graph really speaks to the question of, is the cure worse than the disease? Right, you don't hear people talking about that much anymore, but early on there was a lot of conversation about it. Um, and essentially what we're doing is we are saving lives um, by hurting the economy. Right? So hurting the economy, saving lives. Well, okay, so that's a tough calculation. Um, is it worth it? Well, economists are sort of uniquely suited to answer this question. Uh, it's a rare moment of unanimity in the profession where we're pretty much all saying, yeah, this is worth it. And we're saying that because we're all using sort of the same tool, cost-benefit analysis. Um, and here's sort of a back of the envelope, um, brief description of the, of the calculus, right? And that is to look at the benefits of social distancing, right? The benefits are lives saved. Uh, and it was estimated that somewhere between 200,000 and 2 million people would die if we don't social di socially distance and shelter in place. So we're gonna use the number 600,000, it'll be a little bit on the low or conservative side. And suppose we save 600,000 lives, right? At the same time, uh, we need to put a value on each life. Uh, and economists do this fairly regularly, as do lawyers, uh, other professions, I'm not sure are all that comfortable with it. Right, but economists estimate that the value of what we call a statistical life, that's not anybody in particular's life, but a statistical life, is somewhere between 5 million and 14 million. So here we'll use something again on the low end, so we're conservative, $7 million per life, 600,000 lives saved. 
multiply those two together and you get $4.2 trillion uh, worth of lives saved, right? There are also a bunch of long-term health issues that might arise. Folks who get COVID might have long-term respiratory disorder. We assume that there are 2 million of those and we value each one of those at about $500,000. That gives us a trillion dollars worth of saving, right? So add those two together and the benefit of social distancing is $5.2 trillion, okay? Uh, that's the benefit. Then we have to look at the costs, right? The cost of this is the economic activity that's foregone. Right, and estimates are, uh, you know, uh, it's a shot in the dark, but estimates are that we're gonna lose about 70 plus work days for the whole economy. And if we lose that, that's, that's tantamount to about $1.3 trillion worth of economic spending that doesn't happen, right? So that's the economic hit. So the calculus here is to compare $1.3 trillion with $5.2 trillion and say, well, 5.2 trillion is a lot bigger than 1.3 trillion, right? So yes, it's worth it. And because that gap is so big, um, economists are pretty comfortable saying that we're doing the right thing. But one question that, that generally pops up is, well, what about the $2.2 trillion spending package? Um, and that is not, econ not economic activity foregone, right? That's borrowing from tomorrow. So it's economic activity that we're not gonna get tomorrow. And it's giving today. So we're moving economic activity from tomorrow to today. So it's not foregone, it's just changed temporarily. Right, so that doesn't belong in this calculus, right? So there is, there's the, the reason that economists generally say, yes, uh, it's worth it what we're doing. Okay, um, so let's look a little bit about the, at the fiscal policy timeline. Here's a timeline. Um, I wanna put it up here for those of you that download the slides. Um, I'm not gonna talk at great length because of time, um, but there's money for public health, medical supplies, research and development, paid sick leave, uh, COVID testing, unemployment expansion, that includes the $600 per week, you know, household payments, support for small firms and medium-sized firms, that's the Paycheck Protection Program, more unemployment insurance, some but not very much aid to states, and then an expansion, more of the PPP, uh, doing it right this time, the COVID-19 testing, and some money for hospitals, right? Um, I have some quibbles with this that I'll talk about in, in a few minutes. Um, that said, this is a lot of money. This is about $3 trillion worth of spending. A lot of it will come back because a lot of the paycheck protection uh, money will turn out to be loans uh, or there are a lot of companies that took it that didn't need it and will just give it back at the end of the day or have already given it back. Nonetheless, it's going to have pretty significant federal budget implications, right? Uh, in particular, uh, our budget deficit uh, for 2020 uh, was forecast to be about $1.1 trillion. Instead, it's likely to be about $3.8 trillion. That'll bounce back down, but not all the way for the next few years. And uh, that's gonna have implications for our debt, right? Our debt had been growing and chugging along and we were at about 80% of GDP. The federal debt was about 80% of GDP. That's gonna jump right up to 100%. Um, and it's gonna continue to increase over the course of the next five, six years. Um, so it's got real deficit and debt implications. So the question naturally arises, well, how do we pay for all of this? Well, the answer is, and I alluded to it, that you know, we borrow from tomorrow. We borrow from next year, the year after, and the year after, right? Um, and the, the, the good news um, is that treasury rates are near zero, so borrowing costs are very low. The bad news is that our budget situation was already a mess, right? We were already running trillion dollar deficits. Um, and the CBO uh, had estimated that here again, this is uh, our debt relative to GDP. It peaked during World War II, that was the all time high, uh, at a little bit over 100%. Now we're at 80% and that's forecast. This is, this is before COVID hit. We were forecast to go up to about 180% of GDP by the year 2050. Right now, we're going to jump up 20 percentage points here, which means we're also going to be 20 or more percentage points higher there. The long-term budget outlook was a mess. So then the question rises, is this a good idea? Right? And well, we all live in California, so we're familiar with this analogy. Right? If, uh, if we're in a drought, uh, you know, when the house is on fire, you don't worry about the fact that we're in a drought. You put the house out. Uh, you pour water on the house, and then tomorrow you worry about the fact that we're in a drought. Well, our, our economic house is on fire. We were in a drought, um, but this is another rare moment of unanimity in the economic, economics profession that we shouldn't worry about it. We need to spend this money now, um, and we'll worry about it later. 
right? We have the borrowing capacity. We also have the, the economic and wealth wherewithal to pay it back uh, later on. So, so we're doing the right thing. Um, monetary policy, the Federal Reserve, this stuff is super complicated. So I don't really have time to discuss it in detail. Um, but the Federal Reserve has done a great job of, of acting to stabilize the economy and to maintain liquidity of the system. You know, they've dropped interest rates, they've injected cash into the system by buying treasuries, and they've, backed, they, they, they've offered to back a lot of debt that's out there, debt that might have gone bad because people were afraid that the companies would go under. The Federal Reserve has jumped in and said, you know, look, we're going we're gonna to back that debt. We'll make good on it. And so they've injected four to five trillion dollars worth of liquidity into the system. Here again is a timeline. Um, I won't go through it, uh, but for those of you that will download the slides, here it is. Um, okay, uh, so one of the fun things about this from a, from a data geek perspective, of which I am definitely one, um, is that we can look at treasury rates and see uh, the Fed policy in action. Right? So the orange line up here, that's the 10-year U.S. Treasury note. Right? Um, and we see this is, this is the, you know, when the stock market started to tank, everybody ran to safety. Um, take the money out of the stock market, throw it in treasuries because we know we're not going to default on the treasuries. We did a lot of that until the economy started going bad. And a lot of folks said, oh, well, uh oh, uh, I'm going to need the, the money. I'm going to need the cash to pay my bills. And uh, so they started selling treasuries. And then the, the Federal Reserve came in and injected a bunch of liquidity and drove the interest rate back down. Right? So the interest rate was up here about 1.5% down to about 0.5, up to 1.2, and because of the Federal Reserve, we're back down to about 0.7% now. Right? So interest rates are very low, making borrowing for the, for the federal government relatively low costs. All right, some of my thoughts on policies to date. Uh, you know, we, costs are enormous, but we're doing the right thing. We're doing it very quickly. And um, that was really important. We can sort of see that in the NASDAQ. Right here, I've got the blue line is what the NASDAQ did during the global financial crisis. It took 500 days for it to reach a trough. This is its peak. The NASDAQ peaked on uh, Halloween in 2007. Right, the red line, that's what we're experiencing now. NASDAQ peaked on uh, February 19. It troughed down about 31%, but it's now uh, at an all-time high. Right, uh, it in fact is higher than it was at the peak before the crisis started, 0.7 percentage points above. Um, right, so the NASDAQ has bounced back, um, partly because policies have, have happened so very quickly. Right, some other thoughts on policy, oops. Um, what's going on here? There we go. Um, all right, so, uh, so uh, in terms of monetary policy, I think I mentioned uh, the Federal Reserve has been heroic. They pulled out the playbook that Ben Bernanke wrote during the finan global financial crisis implemented all of those plays and then started uh, on some new plays. Um, fiscal policy, you know, done very quickly and that's great. Uh, so they get an emergency pass on a pass fail system. But you know, whenever Congress does something quickly, it, it often misses the mark. Um, and I think it's missed the mark with a lot of its policies. Um, you know, in particular, the $1,200 cash payments to families. Well, the families that had a $7,500 a year income before this and didn't lose their jobs, they're getting the, the check. Um, I'm not sure that's the right way to go. The Paycheck Protection Program, I'm not sure that it got money into the hands of businesses that really needed it. I have friends at wealth management firms that got the money and they're doing just fine. And the money's just sitting in a bank in case they need it. That's not the intention of the Paycheck Protection Program. And I don't think we've got the right strategy to maintain the employee-employer ties. I'll talk about that in a second. And then what about state and local, local uh, governments, right? So in terms of maintaining employee-employer ties, Folks generally turned to Denmark, all right? What Denmark did at the beginning of this was they said to companies, all right, look, keep people on payroll and we, the, the government, will pay 80% of their salary, right? So maintain that connection, keep them on payroll so that when you go back, when you need them again, you just say, hey, come on into the office. We didn't do that in the United States. We said, you know, go ahead and lay people off and we will pay uh, their, their income through the unemployment insurance process. Right, so some of those folks, you know, we've got 14% unemployment in the United States, whereas Denmark was down around 2%, right? So big difference. And um, this is going to be harder to put the pieces back together than when, as Denmark did, they kept things going, right? In Germany, in fact, the unemployment rate went down. I can't talk intelligently about exactly what Germany did, um, but that's quite remarkable throughout all, all of this. And so we could do it better. Economists will study this to death over the course of the next few years. Um, so we'll have a firm answer um, probably in two to three years. 
right? Uh, what about state and local governments? Um, state and local governments are suffering a lot. We can see uh, during the Great Recession, um, 2010, state and local governments ran sort of a cumulative $230 billion deficit. In, 2000, in, in the, the, the fiscal year that starts in July and runs through the middle of 2021, they'll run collectively a $290 billion deficit. Here in California, it'll be about a $54 billion deficit. So this, this is gonna impose enormous cuts on state and local governments, right? Uh, I think California's talking about 10% across the board. My local school board is talking about 10% across the board. Um, and there is no fat in school budgets, right? There is no fat to cut. Um, so that means that uh, class sizes are going to have to get bigger. Um, a lot of external services like counseling or healthcare, those services are going to be, be cut. Um, a lot of, you know, for a lot of us, it's just at the state and local level, level where kind of the rubber hits the road with government providing services. Um, potholes getting filled, police and fire services, those are all going to be cut. They were cut enormously during the global financial crisis, um, and they're going to be cut again during this. So we're gonna, we're gonna feel it locally unless the federal government comes in up with a lot of money for state and local governments. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the inequities here. I'm sure all of us have heard about the racial inequities. It turns out that uh, African-American and Latino communities uh, are con contracting coronavirus at much higher rates. Their hospital rates of hospitalization are two to three times that uh, of white communities. Telecommuting, telecommuting is great. Lots of people are doing it but they tend to be people um, with relatively high paying jobs. It's primarily low wage jobs that are at risk throughout all of this. And those folks who are working those low wage jobs, they don't have the, re the resources to weather this kind of a storm. It was estimated before this that 40%, four zero, two fifths of all households in the United States did not have cash on hand to weather a $400 economic crisis. And this is much bigger than a $400 crisis. And then there are educational inequities, right? My son's doing just fine. You know, he fired up the Wi-Fi and got his assignments, did his work, and signs in for, to Zoom to meet with the teachers. But uh, he goes to school with, the, with kids. About half the kids there are um, low income, and they don't have Wi-Fi at home. Um, so they're struggling. They were behind the eight ball education-wise, and now they're a little bit further behind the eight ball. Um, and I've got a little bit of, of uh, inform uh, evidence here on the inequity of COVID, it hits hitting low power, high poverty neighborhoods much worse. The blue line here, those are high poverty neighbor, neighborhoods in Los Angeles, California. And this is cases per 100,000 residents, right? So it's been going up steeply. Whereas if you look at low poverty neighbor, neighborhoods, the wealthier neighborhoods, it's been going up, but at a much lower rate, right? So it's hitting high poverty neighborhoods what, much worse than low poverty. And the jobs that are at risk, this is the employment change by income quintile, right? So the first quintile, these are the low income workers. F fifth quintile, these are the higher income workers. Higher income workers lost about 10% of the jobs. Low income, about 35% of the jobs. So it's hitting low income folks uh, harder than higher income folks. And uh, you know, about 40% of the workers losing their jobs earned less than $40,000 per year. So the hardship down at the lower end uh, is significant. I mean, our government's doing the right thing, trying to funnel money to, to those households, right? Um, so what does the future bring? Um, depends on the ties between employers and employees. Hopefully we'll have a pretty easy time turning the switch back on, but I confess to not being terribly optimistic. We're gonna have a lot more government aid, particularly to state and local governments, I hope. More aid to the vulnerable. The, the $600 check bonus that you get for unemployment insurance that expires at the end of July. Um, I think that it's going to be much longer than the end of July when we're going to need extended unemployment. Ultimately, we're going to need stimulus, um, but when? That all depends on how well we deal with this, and in a minute I'll make the case we're not dealing very well with it. There will be structural changes to the economy. There will be more telecommuting. I don't think that Twitter is going to make good on its promise. Twitter announced that, oh, you know, its workers don't ever have to come back into the office. Well, I, and, and so some of them are moving to, to Idaho, Wyoming, you know, places where it's nice to live and very cheap, but keeping their job, their well-paying job at Twitter. I think those workers are going to find that it's very hard to climb up the ladder uh, without showing them their face in the office. And I think bosses are going to find it very frustrating, not ever just having random conversations with their employees. So I don't think Twitter is going to make good on that promise long term. We're kind of in a telecommuting honeymoon. Um, 
This is one grand experiment in telehealth, which I think is fantastic because the inefficiencies in going to get a healthcare. Um, you know, before this, how many of us have gone to to our doctor and sat in the in the waiting room for half hour, forty five minutes? I venture to guess that it's all of us, right? With telehealth, you don't have to do that. Uh, on the downside, a little bit, there will be a more rapid adoption of technology. Right, firms who can uh, use robots and, and machines rather than people will, because this is probably going to happen again, um, and it's easier to shut down and start back up if you don't have employees. Um, it's going to change the way that we buy things. Uh, a lot of us did not buy a lot from Amazon prior to this. Now we're buying it from Amazon. We're getting pretty comfortable with it. So I think brick and mortar retail uh, is going to take an, an enormous hit from which it will never recover. Um, and I think that we're headed for a potentially dangerous reopening. Uh, we're in the process, I think, of a potentially dangerous reopening. I think more people will die. We're going to have a loss of public trust. I'll show you in a minute that uh, the cases are going up uh, and it's not just because we're testing more. Right, so first, what, what about economic forecasts? These are growth projections for 2020 this year. Um, estimated that uh, we will have positive growth in the third and fourth quarters, so we'll make up for the 40% decline in the second quarter. So on average, we're gonna have a decline, people think, of between five and 6% in 2020. That's gonna be followed in 2021 with growth between four and 5%. So it's not gonna be enough to recover. Uh, so by the end of 2021, we will not be, we will not have as much economic activity as we had at the beginning of 2020. And it will take some time into 2022, perhaps even 2023, for us to get back to where we were earlier this year. And again, we won't get back to where we otherwise would have been until 2029. So the recovery is a long road. Now, I worry about the opening because I see graphs like this, right? This, this red line, that's the seven day average of new cases. Um, and for the last couple of weeks, we've been trending up. And that troubles me. And I first thought, oh, well, we're testing more. So maybe that's just naturally going to happen. And it turns out it's not because of testing. Um, the, the rate of positives with each test is higher now than it was a month ago. Um, if you look at a graph for California, I apologize for not putting it in here. Um, cases in California have never had this decline that the nation did as a whole. Right? This decline is primarily because of what, uh, what happened in New York and New Jersey. Right? Everybody else continued on a steady growth in cases. Right? And not much has changed. We don't have a vaccine. We don't have a cure. Um, we don't, uh, you know, we're a little bit more aware of how to protect ourselves. So some opening up is probably reasonable, but I really worry that we're going too fast. Gyms in particular scare the bejeebers out of me. Right? You know, the notion that people aren't going to be spreading COVID germs in a gym, um, I find hard to swallow. At the same time, if you look at deaths, um, you know, maybe we're not reopening too soon because deaths have been on a pretty steady trajectory down. It may just be that deaths are lagging the increase in cases and that this is going to turn up in the next couple of weeks. I certainly hope not, um, but I'm guessing that it probably will. So we need to slow this opening down. I was very happy when Gavin Newsom last week announced, okay, just everybody in California, when you're out and around people, you got to wear a mask, period, full stop. I think that was a really, really good move. Um, more on opening. Um, so this is evidence from a group called Homebase. Um, they collect data for, on small businesses that hire a lot of hourly workers. Here is the, the, the sector that was hurt the worst. Think um, nail salons and, and, and haircuts, right? Hours worked in those shops were down 93% back in April 10. Right? And it was April 10 when we really started opening after being closed for about three weeks. And now this sector has recovered about half of its employment. Um, for the United States as a whole, we were down 60% of the hours. Now we're down only 25%, right? So we have substantially reopened. Um, and I confess it kind of frightens me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat the horse a little bit more. Um, so this is data from, um, uh, from Apple uh, on mobility trends. Right, so this is the, the red line here. And that's requests for directions from people who are driving. This red line is where we were uh, in early January, right? So now driving directions request is well above where it was in January. That may be because people are going places that they, they wouldn't have otherwise gone, so they don't know how to get there. So just the, the number of requests is up. But this trend up, um, I find startling. You know, the, the fact that people aren't taking transit doesn't surprise me very much. 
um, but we're coming out too fast. Part of the reason I worry about coming too fa out too fast is because it's not as simple as flipping a switch off and then back on, right? We're gonna flip it back on, um, but it's gonna happen very slowly as folks in Georgia are learning, right? On April of 24, they ended the stay at home order, right? Uh, but consumer spending did not increase. It stayed pretty steady. And that's because people were pretty leery about going back out. People are being cautious. Right. And so a lot of firms are going to try to open up. They're not going to find the consumption. It's going to be very expensive for them. And if we are opening too soon and we have to shut down and then reopen, that means that businesses are incurring that reopening cost twice. And I maintain that it would be better idea to stay sheltered in place for longer than we have to and reopen once than to come out too early uh, and then have to shut down and come out again. I fear that that's what we're doing, however. All right, um, so I'm gonna summarize and then I'll take your questions for as long as you like. Um, COVID-19 is a health crisis with enormous economic implications and enormous built-in inequities. Those at the bottom part of the income distribution are taking the, brunt, the bulk of this injury. GDP gonna contract significantly this year. We'll have positive growth next year, but we're not gonna recover where we were in early 2020 until sometime in 2022. I think we're opening too soon. It's got enormous costs in terms of life and the economy. What comes next from an economic perspective? This is, this is enormously difficult because a lot of what comes next is human nature. Um, and economists make forecasts based on our intuition and based on history. But we don't have anything in history that looks like this. So we're hamstrung in terms of history and our intuition is also hamstrung because politics plays such a significant role in this. Um, so I think a lot of statistics and data are going to vacillate up and down, good and bad, um, for some time yet to come. I think 2020 is going to be a really difficult year throughout. Okay, um, that's what I have. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. Here's information on how to communicate with need. I'll send that information uh, to the organizers and they can distribute it out to the rest of you, um, along with the URL for my slides uh, once we're done. Uh, I'll also we'll hope, hopefully put a video up on, up on Need's website. Okay, so I'll stop share. Actually, as a teaser, I wanna mention that there are a bunch of bonus slides that I didn't have time for. There's another 20 slides of graphs for all of the, the data geeks out there. So I'll encourage you to go to Need's website and download the slides. Um, but for now, I'm happy to take questions uh, for as long as you like. All right, I think what we'll do, thank you very much, John. That was very informative. And uh, what we'll do for the question and answer if you could just uh, raise your hand, put it like in front of your screen and wave it, I think that, that way we get your attention. Um, and then uh, I'll go ahead and uh, probably just unmute you here on the on this end so you can start talking or, uh, well, well let's, let's do this. We'll just acknowledge by the name, go ahead and and uh, speak. Actually, you know, be, raise your hand. Be, before and, we get started on that, Marcelino, I'd like to give a shout out to, to my good friend, John Foote. John, it's oh. good to see you. Yeah, there's John. Hey, John. Hi, John. Yeah, great. John is um, new. So, what's that? Go ahead. See you at the pool one of these days. <laughs> so, um, so if you have a question, go ahead and uh, just uh, press your space bar, hold it while you're talking, and um, ask the question. I have a question. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, what is the difference between laid off and furloughed? To me, people who say they've been furloughed means that they have, uh, the employer has promised their job back if at all possible. That's not a promise, that's a hope. And they're relying upon that hope to get them by. Is that yeah. the right interpretation? So, so generally the difference between layoff and a furlough is that if you're laid off, then all ties are severed, right? Your healthcare is over, you can do COBRA, um, but they're not providing you with any benefits. With a furlough, it's at the employer's discretion, whether or not they continue to provide healthcare benefits. My understanding is that a lot of firms are not continuing to provide healthcare benefits. So although most of the job losses have been categorized as furloughs, they look an awful lot like layoffs. Okay. What also is your call upon about the um, what will happen in, after July when the six hundred dollar per month is uh, perhaps let, let's say is not uh, reinstated in some way? Well, my my hope is that it will be reinstated in some way, but but not six hundred dollars. 
right? It never should have been $600 because that's an extra $2,400 a month. Um, and that's more than a lot of people who were late, being laid off made uh, on the job, a, a lot more. Um, and so th a lot of those folks are, are not going back to work when they're being recalled because they're making more on unemployment. Um, it needs to be some sort of a, a, an increment beyond what they otherwise would have gotten, but something that's related um, to how much they would have gotten uh, regardless. Um, so that's, that's, that's another problem with, with the fiscal response that, that should be fixed in the extension that I hope happens after the end of July. All right, we have a question from Russ and then now uh, Ron after that. Uh, on the uh, ballot, we have, uh, if we're going and knocking down Proposition 13 uh, on businesses, how do you think that will, if that goes uh, through, how that's going to affect business? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I had a hard time hearing the first part of your question. On the ballot for November, yes, is, is to knock down uh, Proposition 13 on businesses. Yeah. What do you think the effect will be if that passes? What will that be the effect on business? Yeah. Um, so if you'd asked me in January, I would have said, I think that's a really, really good idea uh, to split the role. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar, that's, that's taking commercial real estate out from under the Prop 13 umbrella. So the commercial estate would be reappraised every time it, it changes hands. I'm, I'm sorry, on an annual basis, not every, just every time it changes hands. So that means that property taxes on commercial property would, would go up pretty significantly. Um, and you know, the notion of doing that um, when I think that commercial real estate is probably going to be in a state of turmoil um, is, is, is difficult at best. Um, you know, some of that's going to be ameliorated by the fact that, that commercial property is going to take value, commercial property values are going to take a big hit. Um, so the increase in taxes they're going to experience isn't quite as big. Um, but I think that because a lot of tenants are going to be declaring bankrupt, uh, a lot of owners are going to, going to have to sell uh, sort of on a fire sale basis. Um, and as, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a really difficult time with all the telecommuting. Um, a lot of companies that have a lot of space are going to want to downsize. So there's going to be a surplus of commercial real estate probably for the next couple of years. So I would love it if we could pass that uh, in November, but hold off on implementing it for a couple of years. All right, we have a question from Ron Freshman. Uh, you're muted, Ron, you gotta unmute yourself. Hold on the space bar. I have, there it is. Ron, have, also good to I, see I, you. Hey, yeah, John, how you been? Good. Um, yeah, I had a question you know, in regards to the property tax um, uh, that came up, you know, as far as the commercial property. I can't remember that uh, billion dollar uh, bond issue for repairing schools that did not pass, right? Uh, I believe that's, I, I believe that's right. Because if that passed, they were going to use the property tax uh, income off of commercial property to be able to, to repay that uh, billion dollar loan or so, yeah. as I recall. Yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to see significant declines in commercial, in commercial property taxes in the next couple of years. Decline? I, well, I think so. But they would have had to go up in order to pay that bond. Right, and, the, and, they, and, they, gener and they generally do go up, uh, but, but very slowly. But because, because values are going to come down for the next couple of years, I think we'll, we'll see declines. So that'll be another hit to, to state and local government budgets. Right, okay. Well, let's say that the uh, school... Uh, repair bonds had passed, you know, billions of dollars that we had to do debt service on. And the proposition, and that assumed that the proposition to, to be able to tax commercial property uh, when it changed hands would pass because they were gonna use that money to service the debt, if I, if I remember that correctly. Um, Correct, I'm, correction is not when it changes hands. Right, right. The, 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 the change is that it's, it's, it's reappraised every single year. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't see that solely. But the subtlety I was concerned about, John, was that if they're having to do debt service on billions of dollars and the money that's coming in from the commercial property is not sufficient, where does that leave Prop 13 for the homeowner? 
Um, well, Prop 13 for the homeowner will, will, will stay as, as it is. I mean, that, that is so politically charged that uh, it will probably never be addressed. I think it should right. be addressed Prop 13. I, I have a soapbox for Prop 13 that I won't get up on, but I think it's just a horrible thing um, <laughs> for both commercial and residential. Um, we can talk about that later, but we can, we can, right? We can have a whole another hour conversation on that. Um, right. But, but, but you know, the, even if they had had started floating those bonds, they wouldn't have floated all of them immediately. And as soon as this hit, they would have they would have stopped. Oh well, that's encouraging. Yeah. Because I thought it was a scam. <clears throat> pardon me. That the idea that if the commercial property didn't cover it, we would go back then and say, well, we have to meet the debt service, and therefore we have to go back and get the money from homeowners. Yeah, if, if the split roll didn't pass, then we would have had, had to find some other revenue source. And, you know, I, I, I'm okay with that. Our schools need uh, that, that money. They need it desperately. Um, right. I agree with that. And I think that we should pay as we go. We should repair schools. Well, I mean, uh, we're getting a little off topic here. Yeah. But the idea that Prop 13 was a lifesaver for people as they could keep their homes. Other than that, our our homeless rate would be much higher. There'd be much more people on the street. Yeah, but but there, there again, we're, we're getting off topic, but there, there are right. other ways. Um, you know, we, we could have had a, 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 a lien, right? The, the, the state government could have put a lien on, on homes instead of collecting rapidly increasing property taxes. And that lien wouldn't come due until the owners sold or, or died. Right, and and that would have been a much more efficient and effective way of doing it. But again, we're 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 pretty far we're, off topic now. Yeah, they, we, we can spend a, a few drinks on on, on this topic. But and, thanks. And, okay, and well, hopefully one day we over. can run. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other any other questions? All right, Carol, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Or you want me? You're on an iPad. Let me unmute you here. Yeah, it's not letting me because you're muted on your end. Okay, okay. Um, not not mentioned in that very thorough presentation was any effect of international trade or is international obligations. Is are those issues not material to our economy? Um, you know, honestly, they they certainly are. Um, and international trade has dropped significantly, and it's likely to stay that way. Um, so thank you for bringing it up. I really need to to add that into the discussion um, because the, the the fact that this is global and I mentioned that early on and then didn't really build on that um, it means that you know everybody is suffering um, and economic activity and trade are way down um, and we're going to be you know a little leery going forward about opening things right back up to trade. Um, it also means that a lot of companies that do, uh, you know, source their parts from other countries, they're going to be trying to diversify. Um, and that process is going to slow trade down for a while. That's going to raise costs and it's going to reduce economic activity. So yes, the international aspects of this uh, have legs. They certainly do. Thank you. Uh, John, go ahead. Yeah, uh, on your cost benefit analysis of the the lockdown. One thing I, uh, how do you incorporate the fact that as poverty increases, people get unemployed and all that stuff, there are public health uh, costs uh, and bad outcomes that come out of that. I mean. Sure, sure. And, and, and there are folks that have done a more thorough uh, cost benefit analysis. Um, and they, they come out in the same place, you know, the gap may be two trillion um, in, instead of instead of four. Um, but it, but it's still kind of a no-brainer. I mean, it's it's absolutely clear that the economic hardship is leading to more deaths um, from stress, from heart disease. Uh, it's it's really hard to measure that, but but it's it's clear that those deaths exist. Um, but they're small in proportion to the number of of lives saved. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? John Foot, go for it. So, as, as we, we spoke about international, it, nationally we've talked about supply chains being disrupted, and then internationally that's going to be uh, significant as well. And so here you have supply constraint, and you're trying to stimulate demand. Isn't that going to drive inflation? 
Um, so, so we're not really trying to stimulate demand right now. We're trying to facilitate demand where it's necessary. Um, you know, the, the, you could argue that that yes, the federal, the Congress has has chucked three trillion dollars into the economy, um, and the Federal Reserve has chucked about four to five trillion dollars worth of liquidity. Um, so, you know, if if we if we had done that in December, uh, we would have massive inflation. Um, but since consumer spending is, is so low and the mismatch between supply and demand is very much in favor of supply, right? So there's no demand pull um, on prices. Uh, so we're not going to see inflation. Uh, and if you look back to the global financial crisis of a decade ago, enormous amounts of liquidity injected into the system and we never saw inflation. Um, that's because the, the Fed reeled it in pretty effectively. Um, in, in the wake of the crisis. And, and I, I imagine that they'll do so here. Um, you know, I, 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 I have another, another spiel that I add into longer talks, and, and that is, you know, yes, inflation might be a concern down the road, but even if it were to turn up right now, um, you know, we have much bigger fish to fry. Uh, we've, got a, we've got people dying, we need to protect against that, and we've got people who are economically vulnerable and we need to protect them as well. Um, so yeah, inflation down the road is possible because of all of this, but I've got I've got pretty good faith in uh, in the Fed in terms of their ability to reel it back in. Hey, Ron Freshman, did you have another question? I think I, you were raising your hand, or maybe you're just touching your screen. You may have muted. Uh, John, John, did you have a follow up? I actually I did. Um, you know we. we it, Right away when coronavirus came out, there was a, Iran was doing a bunch of stuff, and now we've seen China um, attacking or fighting with India over border. You see, and then you see in the United States the social unrest we're having around the the racial issues, and uh, I think you're seeing um, a lot of unrest and op political opportunism and so forth, distraction. The government's afraid of what the public's going to think. So. They go distract them with, with you know, wars and other threats. Do you see that happening? And if so, what's the effect? Well, you're, you're, you're getting into to politics, geo and otherwise now, um, and I'm an economist, but I, I, I see all of that, right? You know, all of the, the protesting that's going on now, I'm, I'm not for a, a second criticizing or contem condemning it, but it's, but it's dangerous. Um, and, and I think that that will probably increase the at the end of the day the the overall costs and duration um, of the pandemic um, you know I don't, I don't know about governments sort of intentionally saying pay no attention um, but uh, but the, you know the, the war between or the, the the skirmish between China and India is is, is certainly part of that um, you know I think that people are finding diversions um, because people are unhappy it's easier to get just you know, enough unhappy to, to do something um, about something else. Right. Anything else? Any other questions? Uh, go ahead, Steve. I'll take one. Uh, back in February, the stock market was at this all-time high, like S&P was at like 3,300, roughly. Now it's come back to 31 to 3,200, almost the same way. Uh, our economic situation has gotten a lot worse. Uh, do you think that the stock market recovery is all a matter of zero interest rates and there is no alternative? Um, yeah, a little bit of there is no alternative, um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just you know, use Kai Rizdal's phrase, you know, the stock market is not the economy. Um, and the stock market just does, does crazy things. It, it completely overreacts. Um, it has shown, I think, you know, to borrow from Alan Greenspan, a lot of irrational exuberance. Um, at the same time, you know, this, the, 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 price, the stock price of a company um, is, is supposed to be re reflective of the value that it's going to generate over its lifetime, right? And this isn't a situation where there's some fundamental flaw in the economy that we're correcting. And so the value of a lot of businesses isn't permanently reduced, right? This, this is a hiccup. Um, and so the fact, you know, the fact that stock markets went down 30%, I thought was absolutely insane because it's a hiccup. Um, I also think it's a little crazy that they've bounced back as, as far as they have, except the NASDAQ. And there's all sorts of tech companies that are doing out, making out like bandits and that's kind of driving the, the NASDAQ up. 
Um, but yeah, I'll go back to the stock market's not the economy. Um, it's valuing fundamentally different things. Thank you. I think Russ has a question. Go ahead, Russ. Yeah, don't you think that uh, a lot of the big manu uh, retail like Macy's, Penny's, uh, we're seeing a whole bunch of bankruptcies, and I don't think they're ever going to come back, uh, which is a lot of jobs, and it's a whole nother way that we're, the public is going to have to get used to buying. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, and, and I think the problem is that we're getting used to buying a different way. Right. And, and brick and brick and mortar, brick and mortar has been on, on the decline for a long time. Um, but what we've just done is we have exacerbated, we, we've, we've dramatically changed the trajectory of that decline. We've accelerated it very significantly. So yeah, it's going to be a jobs issue. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's starting to, to make people think harder about uh, universal basic income uh, that uh, uh, Lang, the presidential candidate was uh, Yang? I'm sorry, I'm blanking on it right now. Uh, universal basic income may be looking better as you know, jobs for those at the bottom part of the, of the economic distribution, the income distribution, are simply gonna be harder to come by. Um, the hardship at that part of the income distribution is gonna be long lived and we're gonna need policies that last for a while to, to really deal with that. Do you also think that uh, the US has gotta rethink uh, buying out from foreign countries so much uh, like masks and stuff like that, that we need to subsidize some manufacturing here in the United States that we have it of these critical things that they're made here. Well, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm torn um, partly because before this public health experts were saying before, before there was any, even a whisper uh, of COVID-19 public health experts were saying, we just need stockpiles. Right? It costs a lot of money and, and space. So we need stockpiles because something like this is going to come. And you know, had we stockpiles in place, it might not have mattered so much that we're getting our stuff from foreign sources. It might well have. I, I, I just don't know. Um, but you know, we, we needed to stockpile. And you know, another way of, of stockpiling is to have excess capacity domestically for that kind of stuff. Um, and we, at the, at the end of the day, we didn't have either one of those things. And, and I, I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm not expert enough on that issue to know which was the better of those two options. All right. Anyone else? Uh, Steve again, go ahead. Uh, how do you account for the increasing disparity between the haves and the have nots that is measured by the ratio of CEOs salary to the average employee salary or any other measure? Um, yes, yeah, so that is, I, I have a talk on, on income inequality. Um, <laughs> so I could ramble on here for a long time about that because it's complicated. Uh, there's sort of no single source um, other than, you know, the, the federal government uh, sort of stepping out of the picture um, in terms, federal and state and local governments taking out, stepping out of the picture in terms of supporting labor versus owners. Um, so it's, it's very complicated. And if you would all, all like me to come back and, and talk about that, I'd be, I'd be delighted. I love giving that talk. Well, we might just take you up on that. That'd Thank be terrific. You. All right, well, it's um, almost 8.30. Um, if uh, any other final questions, all right, well, thank you very much, John. We really appreciate having you. Um, and that was a great talk, very informative. Uh, we really appreciate it. Well, th thanks so much for having me on and I'd be happy to come on. I've got a great talk on inequality, a uh, great talk on autonomous vehicles. That's always fun. Um, oh, okay. And uh, I am the executive director of a nonprofit. So I would be shirking my responsibilities if I didn't say that uh, Needs website has a donate button on it. Uh, so if you enjoyed uh, tonight, uh, it would be terrific if you uh, thought you might be able to, in a position to support Need at, at any level would be appreciated. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank All you right. very much for thank the you, talk, John. John. My pleasure. Take care.